on the afternoon of April 21st, 2016. Martin Roberts, a 19-year-old college student, was last seen walking away from a bus stop near the intersection of Hardin Street and River Street in Boone, North Carolina. An investigation into Martin's disappearance revealed he left a note in his bedroom stating he was, quote, leaving everyone behind. However, the note didn't mention any plans to harm himself, and despite a thorough investigation, Martin has never been located. It's been almost eight years since he went missing, and investigators continue the search for Martin Roberts. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. And each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. It would be greatly appreciated. So this week's case, Martin Roberts. I feel like I say this a lot, um, but this isn't a case that we normally cover here on Detective Perspective. And the reason I say that this week, like I said, it feels like I'm saying it a lot lately, is because it's not a clear situation where we know that something nefarious took place. As you will see, as I give out the details of this investigation, it's possible that Martin Roberts took his own life. Um, and you, you'll you see how that all comes together as we go throughout this. I'm not going to say for sure that's the case. I'm going to save my opinions on this investigation for the end during the detective perspective when we go over everything. But I just want to put that out there where I looked at it, I read the details on this case, and I I came away with it not knowing exactly how I felt about it. It could go either way. And I feel like if tomorrow someone came down and told me that he was still alive and he was still on, you know, he was on the run or whatever, it wouldn't shock me. And if for some reason, his his remains were discovered. Uh, that wouldn't shock me either. So I'm really interested this week specifically to get your opinions on this investigation because I feel like it's one of those cases where a detective's perspective on it may not give as much as it may in other cases where I can look at it from my own experience and drop some knowledge on what I think about it. I think this is one of those situations where Anybody can listen to the circumstances and develop their own opinions, maybe based on their own personal experiences. So I'll be reading the comments this week. I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say about it. So let's stop talking about it. Let's get right into this week's case. Born on August 19th, 1996, James Martin Roberts, known as Martin, grew up in Kernersville, North Carolina, a suburb of Winston-Salem. His parents, John and Kimberly, later separated and John remarried a woman named Abby. From a young age, Martin was outgoing and friendly, never having trouble making friends. He excelled in sports, especially soccer, and when attending East Forth High School, he was voted team captain. By his senior year, Martin had set his sights on attending Appalachian State University, otherwise known as App State, in Boone, North Carolina. Martin applied and was accepted in the fall of 2014. He moved into on-campus dorms and was soon invited to join the Tau Kappa Epsilon fraternity. He ended up really enjoying the fraternity lifestyle and the brotherhood it offered. Martin loved App State so much that after he finished his first year, he decided to go back for his second year, still as a member of the fraternity. Now, Investigation Discovery reported that on his first night back for his sophomore year, he went to a frat party where he drank with his friends, something many college students do, obviously. But unfortunately, Martin made the life-altering choice of getting behind the wheel 
and was subsequently pulled over and arrested for DWI. Once in jail, Martin called his girlfriend at the time, who lived back home in Kernersville, to come bail him out. When she got to the jail, he had already been released. He offered her gas money, but she was beyond irritated by his choices and told him she couldn't date him anymore. This was obviously not a good night for Martin. Following the incident, Martin called his dad and stepmom to say he needed to take a semester off and come home to get away from the negative influences. He moved back in with them in Kernersville and started working for a family friend. Although Martin lost his driver's license due to the DWI, he thrived at the family friend's business and things seemed to be looking up. In January of 2016, Martin moved back to Boone and started living with three fraternity brothers in an off-campus apartment. Instead of going straight back to App State, Martin chose to take online classes at Caldwell Community College. He had plans to re-enroll at App State in the fall of 2016, where he wanted to study business. Now, just to make note, because Martin no longer had his driver's license, he used Apple Cart, which is Boone's only public bus system, to get around town. He also walked and caught rides from friends when possible. In early April, Martin spent the weekend at his dad and stepmom's house. Later, John and Abby told the Herald Sun that everything seemed normal and they had a good time together. As far as everyone could tell, Martin was keeping up with his schoolwork and was happy to be back in Boone. On Monday, April 18th, Martin spoke to John on the phone. They discussed topics like Martin's grades, his summer plans, and how he was about to pick up his first paycheck from his new job he secured working as a dishwasher. Before ending their call, Martin and John agreed to continue their conversation in a few days. John hung up the phone at that time thinking everything was okay with his son. Two days later on Wednesday, John expected to hear from Martin to continue their conversation. However, Martin didn't answer any of his texts or calls, and this wasn't initially concerning because Martin didn't always answer his phone. But when John hadn't heard from Martin by Friday morning, he felt like something was wrong. John reached out to Martin's landlord and asked him to make contact with Martin's roommates. The landlord called one of the roommates who said he hadn't seen Martin since the previous morning. The concerned roommate then went to check Martin's room to see if he was there, and after knocking on the door a few times without receiving a reply, he entered the room. Martin wasn't there, but a letter written by Martin was found on the table. Now, the full letter has never been released due to its personal nature. However, we do know a few things about its contents. According to Investigation Discovery, Martin mentioned that he was, quote, leaving everyone behind without indicating where he was going to go or how long he'd be gone. Martin expressed his regret that he hadn't taken advantage of the opportunities his family had given him. He was feeling disappointed in himself and described a sense of failure. He also alluded to being tired of his life and not living up to other people's expectations. Notably, there was no mention of him wanting to hurt himself, and the police have consistently refrained from referring to this note as a suicide letter. After reading the letter, Martin's roommate called John and shared what he had just found. Immediately, John knew something was wrong with his son, so he and Abby got into the car and drove straight to Boone. Simultaneously, Martin's roommate called the police and reported Martin missing. When the detective arrived at the apartment and read the letter, he too became concerned with Martin's whereabouts. The roommate then informed the detective that the last time he had saw Martin was the morning prior. Martin had taken a shower, made breakfast, and mentioned going to the library. And at approximately 10.30 a.m., he put a water bottle into his backpack and left the apartment. Now, real quick, I want to stop for a second and talk about this water bottle. When I was first reading this story, I followed up with the researcher, Haley, to ask her about the water bottle. And I specifically said to her, you know, what, what was the bottle? And she said, oh, it's a, it's a water bottle. And I said, was that confirmed? And she said, not that I know of. Uh, so that I, I wanted to mention it here. And the reason why is because the presumption is that it was a water bottle just with water inside of it. But we don't know that for certain. Could there have been alcohol in that bottle that was, you know, poured out the water and replaced it with alcohol? It's possible. And I think that would be significant based on what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And we'll get there and I'll bring this up again. But I just wanted to note that although an, a water bottle was observed, we don't definitively know what that water bottle contained. Now, when Martin didn't return home that night, the roommates weren't initially worried because he had other friends he sometimes stayed with. On the drive to Boone, or soon after arriving, John called Martin's cousin, 
who was the only family member that also attended App State. When John told the cousin that Martin was missing, she mentioned that she had actually run into Martin the day before at approximately 12.15 p.m. on campus near the Convocation Center. She went on to state that they walked to the nearest Apple Car bus stop together, chatting for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. Martin shared his plans for next semester and said he was on his way to his fraternity house. When the bus arrived, the cousin boarded and Martin walked away. She didn't see him again. The police then set out to find surveillance footage of this encounter or any others from the Apple Cart buses, which were fitted with multiple surveillance cameras. After digging through many hours of footage, they were able to obtain a 17-second clip of Martin from around 12.30 p.m. on April 21st. The bus cameras recorded Martin as he walked away from the bus stop toward the busy intersection of Hardin Street and River Street. He was dressed in a black short sleeve App State windbreaker, khaki shorts, gray New Balance tennis shoes, and a white golf visor. He was also carrying a backpack. The 17 second clip showed marching approaching the intersection, and as he did, he paused, looking left and right, but before he could decide on a direction, the bus departed, ending the recording. The police did contact the fraternity house and discovered that Martin had not visited the house on the 21st or any day after that. Despite their efforts, the police were never able to confirm Martin's whereabouts after the 17-second clip of Martin near the intersection. They told Investigation Discovery that it's as if he vanished off the face of the earth after the bus drove away. The police were hoping to figure out which direction Martin chose to go at the intersection and where he could have been going so they searched his room, hoping to find clues there. The police located his laptop, iPad, and also a bag of antidepressant pills, which weren't prescribed to Martin, all inside the room. The pills weren't the type to typically be bought and sold among college students, which left the police confused on how he got them and why he had them in the first place. John told the Winston-Salem Journal, quote, We don't know where the pills came from, whether he was trying to self-medicate, whether he found them, whether someone sold him one thing and it turned out to be something else. One of his friends said the bag had dust all over it, so it was obviously not something he was taking regularly before he left. The police also located Martin's iPhone and wallet inside the room as well. His debit card was still inside his wallet, but his state-issued ID was missing. When the police checked Martin's bank accounts, they didn't find any large withdrawals or suspicious purchases before his disappearance, and there was no activity after. The police were hopeful that maybe Martin's iPhone contained some evidence that could be useful in the investigation, but unfortunately they couldn't unlock the phone, but they could see unread text message and missed calls on the unlocked screen. The police contacted the people who had been trying to reach Martin, hoping they'd find some leads there. And through speaking with these people and other friends and family, the police were able to put together a rough timeline of the events leading up to Martin's disappearance. On Tuesday, April 19th, a frat brother drove Martin to get a haircut and groceries. According to the Winston-Salem Journal, he purchased mostly frozen dinners and pizzas. However, when police searched the mini-fridge in Martin's room, none of those food items were located. Police questioned if he had taken the food with him, maybe it was in the backpack he was last seen carrying. On the night of the 19th, Martin went to Klondike Cafe with some friends to attend trivia night. Friends reported that Martin seemed himself, being the life of the party and making people laugh all night. The following day, on Wednesday, April 20th, Martin was supposed to talk to his dad to continue their previous conversation, but as we know, that never happened. Instead, Martin abruptly dropped out of his fraternity, withdrew from the fraternity group chat, and went silent, not responding to any of their texts. Now, Martin had also exited a high school group chat that included his ex-girlfriend, she was concerned, so she reached out to Martin separately in a text thread and asked if everything was okay. Martin's responses were cryptic, stating things like, quote, no one can help me at this point, and quote, there's nobody I can talk to. That brings us to Thursday, April 21st, the last day Martin was seen. And as we've already talked about in the morning, he told his roommates he was going to the library. However, when he ran into his cousin on campus, he claimed he was heading to the fraternity house. After he finished talking to his cousin and walked away from the bus stop, he was never seen again. When the police interviewed Martin's friends and family, they learned other important details about Martin and his activities in the months leading up to his disappearance. 
Through these discussions, it became evident that Martin had been selectively revealing and hiding details about his life, tailoring the information based on who he was talking to. For example, while John and Abby were aware of Martin's DWI, his mother and sister didn't know the full story. He had told them he received a drunken disorderly citation while walking home, not that he had been driving while intoxicated. In addition, while John and Abby knew about Martin taking online classes at Caldwell Community College, his mother, sister, and other friends were led to believe he was attending App State. The mystery deepened when police checked Martin's records for Caldwell and learned that he hadn't logged into his online classes for approximately a month prior to his disappearance. This was obviously interesting considering he had been telling his dad he was studying hard and even completing extra credit. Martin had also told his friends and family he had been working multiple jobs. However, when police contacted the places he claimed to be working at, they learned that he had applied to all of the businesses, but was never hired. That meant the paycheck Martin had mentioned to his father on the phone wasn't real. The police also uncovered at least one more lie Martin had been telling. According to Martin's friends, there was a noticeable change in his behavior after he returned to college in January of 2016. He appeared less interested in having fun and spent more time alone. His roommates also noted frequent absences, and when they asked what he was doing, he claimed to be with his cousin who also attended App State as we pointed out earlier. However, when the police spoke to the cousin, she revealed they didn't spend much time together. In fact, their encounter on the 21st was coincidental as they hadn't seen each other in a very long time. After speaking with Martin's friends and family, it was clear that Martin was hiding at least one thing from everyone he knew. It seemed as if he wanted everyone to believe he was doing fine and that's exactly what everyone thought. However, it was now obvious he wasn't doing that well at all. In addition to interviewing Martin's friends and family, the police were also fielding tips from the public about his disappearance. The most reliable tip they received came from an acquaintance who claimed to have seen Martin at around 2 p.m. on the 21st, walking not far outside of town on Flannery Fork Road between Winkler's Creek and Payne Branch Roads. Based on this location, the police thought Martin could have been heading toward Trout Lake, a popular area for college students who wanted to enjoy water activities and hiking trails that wind through the dense woods in the mountains. Martin had gone on leisurely hikes there before with friends, making this tip a promising lead. The police wondered if Martin had packed his frozen food for an extended hike and if something had happened to him while he was on the trails. However, Martin's family found this scenario hard to believe. He wasn't known for taking long hikes and his outdoor experience was limited with only a handful of camping trips throughout his life. To pursue this lead, the police deployed a highway patrol helicopter equipped with infrared technology to search the lake area, but unfortunately this effort didn't turn up any significant leads. Despite extensive physical searches in other locations, including App State Campus, there was no sign of Martin anywhere. The police continued their intense investigation, filing more than 30 warrants for evidence, including Martin's iCloud data. Unfortunately, none of the warrants uncovered any solid tips. The police also contacted Apple Cart, taxi services, Uber, and Lyft to figure out if Martin had used any of these services to leave town, but unfortunately, it doesn't appear that he did. Meanwhile, Martin's family hung flyers, pleaded with the public for information, started a Facebook group, helped find Martin Roberts, and gave DNA samples just in case remains were found. They were doing anything they could to help aid in the search. John and Abby told WFMY News 2, quote, The situation is very unusual, very strange, very unexpected. Martin has never had any kind of situation where he just left and had been alone like this. We didn't see this coming and had no clue that anything like this could possibly happen. By the end of May, Martin had been missing for over a month and the police had no information on his whereabouts. Desperate for leads, the Boone police chief sent out a letter to residents asking them for information regarding Martin's disappearance. The chief mentioned that the department had learned there were periods of time where Martin's whereabouts couldn't be accounted for by his friends and roommates. This led them to believe that there was a quote, person in the community who had knowledge of Martin, but might be hesitant to come forward. The chief addressed that person directly stating, quote, to this person, I want to speak with you. Our conversation can be private, anonymous, and discreet. Now, before I continue, this is interesting to me. I think I know where this came from. As I said earlier in this story, 
Uh, the roommates had mentioned that Martin would disappear for a few days and they just, you know, assumed he had been staying with other people. Now, because this is an open investigation, I don't know if there's more behind the scenes that suggest there's another person that is tied to this where that he would, you know, he was staying with this person on occasions. I'm assuming based on the fact that the chief was willing to put out this letter, that might be the case. But just to counter that point and with the limited knowledge that I have about the specifics of this case, you could also argue that when Martin took off, he was going to Trout Lake or going somewhere and just camping out for a few days to be by himself. Who knows what he could be doing? There might not be that other person. That may be why the chief never received a response. Am I mad about this attempt? Absolutely not. I love that he did this because just in case that that is true, and maybe he didn't even know if it was or not, he at least tried something and put the feelers out there. So I don't discount what he did. I just don't know if it, if it's tangible enough to lead anywhere. And, and I'm cautious about what it could actually mean because there's a real possibility that there was nobody else and that Martin was doing exactly what people started to learn as the investigation unfolded, which was he was really staying to himself most of the time, whether that was at his apartment or somewhere else that we're not aware of. And to that point, the chief didn't get any responses from his letter, but fortunately the police still had other leads to chase down. By this point, they had been notified of two more sightings of Martin on April 21st in the Trout Lake area at around the same time Martin's acquaintance had previously reported seeing him. These two tips added more credibility to the possibility of Martin going to the lake after the bus stop. Police told Investigation Discovery that they had to consider the possibility that Martin had gone to the lake to commit suicide. It wasn't unheard of for people to do that at the lake, so they decided to focus their efforts there. The police used cadaver dogs and sonar to search Trout Lake, its reservoir, and the surrounding woods, but Martin was not found. As you might expect, the police were beyond frustrated at this point. They told the Winston-Salem Journal, quote, we are doing everything we can, but the frustrating part is that we come up with nothing. We are still banging our heads against the wall. Now, as a detective, as a police officer, I can confirm, I've been there. This definitely happens. This on the surface would seem like a pretty easy case to solve, right? We're not talking that old of a case. Technology's available. You got cell phones, GPS data, witnesses. It's a you know college area. You would think a lot of people would have seen Martin on the day of his disappearance. Maybe there would have been people at Trout Lake, et cetera. In this day and age, the digital day and age, it's very hard to disappear. And yet this young kid was able to do it. And that's frustrating as an investigator to not be able to track this person down, whether they're dead or alive. And so when you're following up on all these leads, I can tell you from firsthand experience, it's not like a movie where you know the end. You sometimes have to explore a hundred leads before you get one that actually is relevant and credible. So the frustrating part is going through all of those tips one by one and being disappointed one by one when you find out based on information you know, and maybe they don't know that what they're telling you doesn't line up with the rest of the story or isn't credible based on the information you have, the evidence you have. And so it, it can be demoralizing to follow lead after lead, trail after trail, and come up to a dead end. And I do think that's what separates good investigators from the great ones. It's that discipline. It's that determination to continue forward. Regardless of how many doors close on you, you have to remember that there's always going to be another door that may open. And the ones, the, the investigators that are able to keep that mindset and do that the best to keep pushing forward, the ones that are the most persistent are the ones that usually have the most success. Now in July, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children joined the efforts to locate Martin. The lead investigator for Martin's case spent two days with the investigators from the center, getting them up to speed on the case. Unfortunately, despite their joint efforts, the case remained unsolved and the progress began to slow down drastically. April 21st, 2017 marked one year since Martin had last been seen. John told the media that the past year had been a roller coaster of emotions. He said, quote, there's times when it can grab you and just really turn you inside out with the not knowing and the thoughts of all the bad outcomes that could have happened or could still happen. 
The police reported that an incredible amount of work had been poured into the case in the past year, but they were still coming up empty handed. For the one year mark, the department blocked off two days to conduct a thorough review of the case. Additionally, they brought in outside investigators to provide a fresh perspective and determine if anything had been overlooked. These efforts were helpful, but they didn't solve the case. Now, although it didn't solve the case, I want to point out here how important that is, because I stress this in a lot of the investigations that we cover here on Detective Perspective and also have covered on Crime Weekly and the other shows that I've done. Not every department is willing to put egos aside and take an audit, an, an account of their own work. And the fact that on the one year mark, they were able to say, hey, let's sit down first and foremost and do a review from start to finish to see how we did here. Did we do everything we could? Is there anything we missed? And obviously, when you're doing a, an audit of yourself, there is bias there. And if you've missed something the first time, you're likely to miss it the second time on review. So to combat that, they brought in outside investigators. Again, putting the ego aside, saying, hey, you take a look at it. Do you think we did anything wrong? Do you think we missed anything? We're open to it. If we did, point it out and we'll look into it. And although it didn't work out in this case, I don't want police departments, agencies to ever be deterred from doing this. This is the right approach. This is the way you confirm that every stone has been overturned, looked under, looked around, thrown off the river, whatever you got to do. They've, they've checked everything that they have at their disposal. All the leads have been followed. All the evidence has been combed through. This is how it's done. And I just want to make note of that and acknowledge that and give credit where credit's deserved. They did it right here. Again, it didn't work out in this particular situation, but that doesn't mean it's not the right decision. Now, in June of 2018, Investigation Discovery aired an episode of the series Disappeared, focusing on Martin's disappearance. The episode highlighted a $10,000 reward available for information, prompting tips from all over the country. Unfortunately, none of these tips included information the police needed to crack this case open. In late 2018, the police were finally able to access Martin's iPhone and conduct a thorough search. John informed the Winston-Salem Journal that the police found, quote, nothing definitive. It's important to note, however, the WCNC reported the police discovered Martin had turned off his location services the day before he went missing. Now, this could be for a couple of reasons here. I don't want to speculate too much because I can't get into the mind of Martin. This could have been because, again, he was in a not the right mind state and didn't want anybody locating him. As we know, he was kind of removing himself from his group chats and all these other things and was stepping back. So this could have been a simple move so that if anyone close to him had his location, they wouldn't be able to find him because he didn't want to be bothered. This could have also been a premeditated plan, whether he was thinking about taking his own life or, you know, disappearing from the map and going off the reservation and, and just kind of taking off. Knowing that he was about to do that, he could have turned off his location services. But I will say that's kind of contradictory to what he ended up doing, which is leaving his iPhone behind. So it could have been an audible. It could have been a change of plans where initially you thought, hey, maybe I'll take my phone with me. I'll just turn off my location services. But then maybe the next day or that night, he decided that he was going to go a different route. Maybe he was going to take his own life. So taking his phone at all would be unnecessary. I hope that's not the case, but that, that is a possibility. April 2019 came, marking three years since Martin disappeared. John shared with the Winston-Salem Journal, quote, We try not to focus on the potential negative outcomes until we're faced with one. We realize the odds are that it's not going to have a positive outcome, but that doesn't keep us from having hope that we will be back together again. On April 21st, 2021, five years had passed since Martin went missing. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released an age-progressed photo of Martin at 24 years old, hoping someone would recognize him. The Boone Police Department stated that they were actively investigating his disappearance and encouraged anyone with information to come forward. Along with the age-progressed photo, John released a statement which read in part, quote, Martin is very well loved by his family and is tremendously missed. We would give anything to have him home. In April 2023, seven years had passed since Martin disappeared. 
The police stated that they were actively pursuing every lead, but unfortunately, none had yielded results yet. The case remains open and active. Unfortunately, that's the last update we have in this case. James Martin Roberts is still missing, and his family is still desperately searching for him. All right, now from my perspective on this case, and it will not be a long one. I know I sometimes say that, and then it is, but this one really is, the case is self-explanatory. It seems like law enforcement has done everything they can in this case, and we're really just waiting on a new tip, a new lead, or for, for Martin to be found, whether that's dead or alive. The jury's still out on that one. You know, just to go over a couple things to kind of recap this whole episode, it, it, I think it's safe to say at this point, at minimum, Martin was going through some things. I don't think that's really up for debate. It's not like he was in a really good place and he just disappeared uh, without any kind of heads up that this this could happen based on what we know now behind the scenes. He was clearly going through some stuff. And, and it started back during the DWI and it kind of just, it, it continued from there. Although on the surface, he was putting on a good front. He was clearly not happy with the current trajectory of his life and he was embarrassed by it. And, and I think that's uh, very indicative of him lying to everyone and trying to paint this picture that things were better than they really were. I think he didn't want to disappoint people. I think he was really disappointed in himself and that he hadn't lived, as he said, up to the expectations that his family had of him and clearly he had of himself. I really don't know what happened to Martin. I don't think anybody does, obviously. Yes, we have multiple accounts from witnesses saying that he was seen in the area of Trout Lake, but nobody saw him in that park. Nobody knows for certain that he didn't walk right past it or drive right past it and continue on wherever he was heading. You know, I had wrote something down when I was reviewing this case, a couple scenarios, and the four scenarios that I've come up with, and I'm sure there's others, but I think the most prominent ones are he went to Trout Lake, he went to the woods, and maybe he was just going to for some fresh air to blow off steam, to think about things. And he got hurt while he was out there and he expired from his injuries. That's one scenario. I think that's the least likely. And the reason I say that's least likely is because of the letter and because of the behavior leading up to it. He was not just going for a walk to blow off steam. This was something way more than that, but I still wanted to put it out there. He could have went to the woods and maybe had a change of heart, but someone out there who had malicious intentions hurt him again I think that's very unlikely. I would put that right next to him accidentally getting hurt. I, It would be too much of a coincidence. Everything that's leading up to it and then he goes out there and then someone else hurts him that day, I, I, I highly doubt it. I think the two most likely scenarios are, one, he was seen near Trout Lake, but he made a decision that he was going to go off the map and he was going to continue wherever the, you know, wherever the wind took him. There's a possibility that Martin Roberts is still out there today. Um, he could be homeless. He could be on the street somewhere. He could be living in another country. No one's going to tell me that it's not possible because we've seen situations, multiple scenarios, where individuals who have been missing for three, five, ten years are found miraculously by a family member who gets in connection with someone because this person's been living on the streets for ten years and nobody knew it. Think about how many homeless people there are in our country. Let's not even get into that whole situation, but there's a lot of them. So is it possible that he's out there somewhere and he just wanted to remove himself from his current life and start a new one? It's it's definitely a scenario. And I think I, I can safely say that his family, John and the rest of their family, obviously hope that's the scenario and that maybe he's going to decide one day that he was good enough because he was and, he, and he'll come home. That's the hope. And I, and I, as a father and as a parent, would hope for the same thing. Now for the other scenario, which is on the table, and I think it's on the table for everyone, is that Martin was upset with where his life was going and had made a decision that he was going to remove himself from this earth, that he was going to go somewhere and, and kill himself in a way that he would never be found. I don't know the topography of the lake area. I don't know what it consists of. It seems like it's a vast area that someone could get lost in. So is it possible that he went out there and took his own life and they just never found him? 
It's very possible. Is it possible that he went somewhere else that wasn't as populated and took his own life? And that's why they never found him. Yes, of course. And based on everything we know leading up to it, the letter, him removing himself from all elements of his life, I think these are all indications of someone who is potentially suicidal. And this wasn't something that happened overnight. It was a, there was a lot of things leading up to it, and we went over them tonight. So is it also possible that he's no longer with us? Yes, of course it is. And I think even John and the rest of the family has come to that realization that that's a, that's a possibility. And I think at this point, they just want to know. One way or the no another, they just want to know what happened to their loved one. They want to know where Martin is, if he's okay, and if he's no longer okay, they want to bring him home. And they want to, and they want to have that, those answers. I don't even want to say closure, but those answers. So that's why I wanted to cover this case tonight. I feel like there may be someone out there, maybe this person that the chief had referred to or, or someone else for that matter who may have an indication of places that Martin had frequented on his own when he would go to blow off steam somewhere that was kind of off the beaten path that may not be known to law enforcement or his family currently. And that could be a potential location for Martin's whereabouts. I also wanted to give uh, exposure to this case and for the simple situation that maybe someone out there in another part of the country has ran across Martin and not even known who they're encountering, who they're engaging with. And that's why we have photos of Martin throughout this episode so that if you or someone else you know has encountered a person who looks like this, maybe they're, maybe he's going by a different name at this point, um, you may be able to give uh, Martin's family some answers. So be on the lookout. Be cognizant of your surroundings. You never know who you're going to run into. Uh, and that's that's where we end this case. I want, I want everyone to be aware of it. I want everyone to be informed about this investigation and know uh, if Martin or someone that's involved with him now that his family is worried about him they love him they care for him and they just want to know if he's okay so if he's out there and he sees this or someone he knows sees this please think about them think about the family members who haven't been able to move on from this and just want answers if he doesn't want to come home that's fine he has that right to do so but his family deserves to know and if he's still out there he owes that to them at least um, and if he's not still out there and if he's no longer with us, I really do hope that based on potential tips that may come from this podcast or another podcast or another show, lead to Martin's whereabouts so that John and the rest of the family can finally at least answer the question, what happened to Martin Roberts? So just to recap this case really quick, the last confirmed sighting of Martin Roberts was at around 12.30 p.m. on April 21st, 2016. He was near the intersection of Hardin Street and Rivers Street in Boone, North Carolina. Martin has brown hair and blue eyes. He's around 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighs approximately 145 pounds. He has a tattoo of three mountains on his left inner forearm and a Bob Marley song quote over his right rib cage, which reads, quote, Don't gain the world and lose your soul. Wisdom is better than silver or gold. Anyone with information is asked to call the Boone Police Department at 828-268-6900 or Crime Stoppers at 828-268-6959. And finally, we talked about it last week, Seasons of Justice. I'm partnering up with them for the month of January. There was a goal set of $1,000. And the last time I checked it, uh, if we go over to it right now, I think it's at like $980. So we almost hit the goal. I have no doubt we're going to hit that. And it already looks like um, they might have upped it because we're so close to it already, uh, where they've raised it to $1,500, which I'm all for. Like I said last week, Seasons of Justice is raising money to bridge the gap between families and police departments who are in need of funding for DNA testing, for any type of new forensic technology like MVAC that costs a lot of money, or for things like billboards. They also provide the funding for that to get the exposure out there about these cases. So if you want to donate to Seasons of Justice, we're going to have the website link right on the screen here. I read it last week, but it's it's long. So I'll have it on the screen if you're watching on YouTube, and I'll have it in the description on both the YouTube and the audio version. And I also want to point out, which I didn't point out last week, if you don't want to use the website, you can also text DETECTIVE to 53555. That's DETECTIVE to 53555. You can donate any amount. I'd really appreciate it. A lot of you guys put it in the comments last week that you donated. So if you want to help out, I'm sure it would mean a lot to the families and it would definitely mean a lot to me. 
That's going to do it for this week's episode. Everyone stay safe out there. I'll see you soon. <laughs>